Hey friends, my name is Stephanie Quick. Welcome back to Difficult Things. This is a, an ongoing module of the Maranatha Global Bible Study in which we grapple with the difficult things of the gospel so that we can do difficult things in light of the gospel. And this session, session 17, about obedience and Sabbath, or obedience and Shabbat, as what I would call the means of anti-fragility, uh, which is a concept we introduced in the last session. We'll get into more here today. Um, session 17 is sort of bookending a subsection of the series, weeks 14, 15, 16, 17, like over the last month, we've we've taken what might feel like a detour a little bit. And maybe you thought, I didn't expect to go through issues of emotional maturity or, you know, whatever the, the themes that we've been discussing. But I think that it's critical to actually having the fortitude to endure in obedience until the Lord returns. So um, anti-fragility, just to, to, to revisit, is the, the concept or idea of being something that is strengthened or improved by, qualitatively improved by adversity. So it's not only more than, you know, being the antonym of fragility, if you are not fragile, you are anti-fragile. It's it's different and distinct from resilience and fortitude, which are good things. So I'm not saying you need to be anti-fragile and not, you know, forget about resilience and fortitude. You need resilience. You need fortitude. That's endurance. Um, but I believe that we have been wired by God as anti-fragile creatures. And because we are anti-fragile, we're actually qualitatively improved by adversity. Um, therefore, we, we use resilience and fortitude like tools in our toolkit. They're, they are traits, um, but they serve and support anti-fragility. So I want to, I'm going to read a couple of, um, couple of things that'll help give language to this idea of anti-fragility and then we'll we'll get into the session. So I was introduced to this phrase. I was reading a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, which I if I could make it mandatory reading for every American, I would. But um they quote Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote a book called Anti-Fragile, which is in a series of things. So he so Taleb is the one who who coined this term and this concept as we're using it. I'm very grateful for it. Um, I, I, I am reading his book. And as I've gone through it, I, I do think that this passage in the coddling of the American mind um, explains it really well. So I'm actually going to just read this quote. Um, he explains how systems and people can survive the inevitable black swans of life and like the immune system actually grow stronger in response. So he asks us to distinguish three kinds of things. Some, like China teacups, are fragile. They break easily and they cannot heal themselves. So you must handle them gently and keep them away from somebody like a toddler who wouldn't know you have to treat this with care and break it forever. And once it's broken, it's broken forever. You sweep it up, you throw it away, it's gone because it was fragile. Other things are resilient. They can withstand shocks. So parents can give their toddlers plastic cups precisely because plastic can survive repeated falls to the floor. You wouldn't give a kid in a high chair a teacup because when they drop it and it shatters, it's gone. But you can give them a plastic sippy cup and they drop it. You just pick it back up and put it back on the tray. Although the cups don't benefit from the falls, they survive the falls, but they don't benefit from the falls. So then Taleb asks us to look beyond what they call the overused word of resilience and recognize that some things are anti-fragile. Many of the important systems in our economic and political life are like our immune systems. They, they require stressors and challenges in order to learn, adapt, and grow. Systems that are anti-fragile become rigid, weak, and inefficient when nothing challenges them or pushes them to respond vigorously. He notes that muscles, bones, and children are anti-fragile. So if you spend a month in bed 
It leads to muscle atrophy and complex systems are weakened or even killed when they are deprived of stressors. We closed the last session talking about your your cardiovascular health is not um, best maintained when you keep your heart rate in this like static baseline of comfort. So if you spend your day on the couch, if you spend every day in the week on the couch and every week of the month on the couch and you're basically sedentary and you don't stress your heart out, your heart doesn't go, oh, cool, I'm in my little happy zone. Your heart actually becomes weaker for it and it increases your risk of your heart dying younger than you would otherwise um, or having some kind of cardiac incident that puts you in the hospital. You're more likely for that to happen if you keep a comfortable heart through your your normal life than if you actually stress your heart out on a regular basis. You're actually going to improve the qualitative health of your heart and your heart is going to live longer. And these are all, you know, generally speaking based on st statistics, but, you know, I am not a medical doctor, so I'm not, I'm not saying I'm speaking generally. Um, so returning to this, he says, much of our modern structured world has been harming us with top-down policies and contraptions, which do precisely this. It's an insult to the anti-fragility of systems. And this is the tragedy of modernity that he, they're using the, they're talking about kind of helicopter parents. He says, as with neurotically overprotective parents, those who are trying to help are often hurting us the most. Again, I recommend the book. Um, So just as a reminder, one of the verses, one of the passages that we've been kind of returning to and coming, you know, just every so often we come back to and remind ourselves of the, the these scriptural pillars and precedents um, that I'm not, it, it's not that I'm, I read a cool book and I think that this word anti-fragile is cool. I actually, I read it and I thought, man, this is the language that we need because all these things are biblical. 1 Peter 1, uh, 6 through 9, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, is tested by fire so that it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy and inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he's not, Peter's not suggesting that like trials and tribulations are a salvific requirement. You don't have to go through hardship in order to be saved. He's just saying, look, between here and there, you walk on the narrow road, the, the various trials, the fires that test your faith, improve your faith. Your faith comes through the fire qualitatively, stronger, more resilient, being found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. You're, you're, it's, that's something you gain on the backside of the fire that you didn't have before the fire, right? So it's not just that the phoenix rose from the ashes and survived the fire, which is resiliency and endurance, which are important, but you're actually improved by the fire. This is why James would say, take, like, count it all joy when you come into various trials, because these various trials are actually serving you so that your faith would be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, that your faith would be mature. And we talked last week that there, there is no spiritual maturity without emotional maturity. Your emotional maturity is your ceiling to your spiritual maturity. So if you want to grow in God, you actually do just have to grow up and put away childish things. Fires, trials, these things are, are tools the Lord uses sometimes to help us do that. So, okay, cool. I want to do difficult things. I want to die without regret. I'll go through the fire. None of it's fun, but I can have a conversation with myself and hype myself up about appreciating the fire. This is, you know, I think like sincerely for, you know, it, it maybe this is giving you language for things the Lord has done in your life or the way he's led your life or things that he's, um, 
I'll put it this way. I'll give you a little bit of my own story. When I was in high school, towards the end of high school, one of my grandparents was really, really sick. And I was praying and praying and praying, you know, faith of a mustard seed. I thought a mustard seed's pretty small. I for sure at least have mustard seed faith uh, for this person to be healed. And I I was like confident, right? Like we're going to come home from school one day and they're going to be completely restored. The disease will be gone. And that is the opposite of what happened. They just rapidly deteriorated, had a really aggressive form of cancer and, and then passed away. And so I was talking to a friend of mine a few years ago. We do every so often we, we hop on the phone. We live in different locations, but we, you know, um, hop on the phone to high five each other and keep each other going. And, and we were, for, we were having a conversation about like moments like that in our lives and, you know, revisiting and remembering testimonies of how the Lord met us and delivered us or, you know, whatever to encourage us in, in the fight of today, you know, or facing tomorrow or whatever. And, and I was telling that story and cause I was so offended after that. I, I like thought, well, you clearly don't hear me when I pray or if you hear me, you don't care. Or like, what was that for? And I'm never going to ask you for anything again. You know, it just it like destroyed me. It was so discouraging. I was so offended. So I was like mad at Jesus for years. And then, and then, so she said, so like, how did he deliver you from that? And, and I said, you know, I don't actually think that he did, <laughs> he just, but he kept me. He has never offered a single explanation to me for why that happened the way that it did. I have no answers. I have no clarity on it. I just know he is the God who raises the dead. And in the resurrection, I'm going to be with my family again, because those who are in Christ are changed in the twinkling of an eye when he comes. And if you suffer the indignity of dying, you're actually the first one to get resurrection, resurrected. And if you're alive when the Lord returns, you actually get to see your family resurrected first because those who are dead in Christ, asleep in Christ, rise first. And then you who are alive when the Lord returns, then you are caught up in the twinkling of an eye and then we will be together with the Lord forever. First Thessalonians 4, Paul says, therefore comfort one another with these words. So I'm comforted by those words, I'm comforted by those promises, but I don't have answers for ways the Lord led me that were deeply offensive to me. But I have to, you, you hit a fork in the road. You know, you either go, I trust you anyway, and you don't actually, you don't owe me an explanation. I'm surrendering this explanation that I feel entitled to, or you cling to the explanation that you feel entitled to and you miss out on Jesus. And if you have to choose between clarity and Jesus, I pray you choose Jesus because he has the words of life and your explanation actually doesn't have the words of life. So where were we? We are strengthened and improved by adversity, anti-fragile. Um, trials and tribulations in your life that maybe don't make sense. You maybe don't have the clarity, you maybe don't have the explanation, but put one foot in front of the other, because if you don't quit, you win. And that, I believe, is the, it's the bumper sticker way of communicating obedience and endurance. And obedience and endurance, I, I think of them like fraternal twins. I don't think they're identical twins. I don't think they're precisely synonymous, but they're family and more than family. I think it's not just that they're siblings. I think they came out of the womb together. Um, I think that when like obedience is the practice of saying yes to Jesus in the moment, you're faced with a temptation and you say no to sin and yes to Jesus. That's obedience. Or, you know, that story that um, and Jesus Jesus said, hypothetically, a man has two sons, right? And he says to the first son, he's talking to one of them in the first conversation and, and says, hey, go mow the yard for me. And, this, and the kid goes, ew, no, 
I was going to play video games. It's Saturday morning. I'm, I'm injecting, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but the idea, he says to one, hey, go mow the yard. And he goes, ew, no. Then he walks away and he's kind of kicking his feet and he goes, I'll mow the yard because my dad told me to mow the yard and I'm going to honor my father and mow the yard. So even though he had a bad attitude, but he obeyed. The second son that he has a conversation with, he says, hey, go mow the yard. And the kid goes, absolutely, dad, anything for you. And then he walks away and he's like, I'm not mowing the yard. Never had intention in his heart to mow the yard, but he lied to his dad in lip service, despite the fact that he knows he's a hypocrite. He thought, I'll, tell, I'll just tell him what he wants to hear. And so Jesus said, you know, he was talking to these folks and he asked, he goes, which of the two sons actually honored his father? And they go, well, I guess the first one did, even though he had a horrible attitude, he had an immature attitude, he at least obeyed. Which isn't the... Um, it's not the best example of maturity and obedience, but I am really encouraged by it because it, it tells me that even when I obey in the thick of a bad attitude, even when I have a bad attitude, the Lord sees my obedience and he values my obedience, even with a bad attitude. So he will deliver me from my bad attitude, because when you were a child, you could behave like a child, but when you grow up, you put away childish things. And you mow the yard with a happy heart. Praise God. Uh, in Psalm 32, the Lord is speaking. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, and they have to be harnessed with a bit and bridle, otherwise they won't come near you. He goes, I'll instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will, I will guide you with my, I'm, my eyes are on you. I see you. This is what Hagar encountered in the Lord, right? Ishmael means God hears. So she has the son Ishmael and then she she's she leaves Abraham and Sarah. She at first she flees and then she encounters the Lord and he he says you should go back, but it, I just I love the poetry of it that she has a son named God hears and then she goes out into the wilderness and thinks she's going to die and the Lord encounters her and says, "Hey, I see your affliction." And she goes, oh my word, I th I've just seen the one who sees me. And she named that place God Sees. She's the first one in scripture to give God a nickname. And she calls him the God who sees. And she has a son named God Hears. I love it. We want to interrupt the Maranatha Global Bible Study for one minute to say this. Our primary burden as an organization is not teaching the Bible to people who have the Bible. Our primary burden as a spiritual family is to declare the name among those who've never heard the name. Romans 15 is our driving passion as an organization to not build on another man's foundation and to lay foundations where there are none. If this is something that resonates with you, if you care about the Great Commission, if you care about the Maranatha message taking root where it's never been declared before, I want to ask you to consider becoming a financial supporter of FAI Studios at a monthly level. We're doing this thing until the sky splits, and we're committed to laboring on frontier fields where there are no foundations and where there are no workers. And this is a very costly task, and we need your help if you care about this. So if you do, click on the link below or go to FAIstudios.org, or you can give through the FAI app as well, safely and securely. Thanks for watching this, guys. Now back to the teaching. But anyway, so he says, I, I, I see you and I will guide you. I'm with you, right? So don't be like an animal that doesn't understand and I have to harness with a bit and bridle just to have this thing come near me. You're not a horse. You're not a donkey. You're not a mule. You are my child, right? So come walk with me and I will guide you in the way that you should go. I am a good sheep. You are my... I'm a good shepherd. You are my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, right? So lean in and listen to your dad. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, you know, this is, you probably heard this, this verse before. Paul says, casting, I'm just, just, I'm not reading the whole passage, just this verse. So it's an incomplete sentence. But he's talking about casting down arguments and taking every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus. 
in your mind. This means obeying in your thought life. If you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So I, I love this verse. I also, part of me, if I'm honest, is like, God, that's really, really specific. It's like the Sermon on the Mount, you know, where Jesus is like, there's, you have heard this like general principle that can be moderated by your behavior. But I say to you that even in your mind, if you hate somebody, you're guilty of murder. Even in your mind, if you lust after somebody, you're an adulterer. So even in your mind, like you, you, I'm reading this, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm like, right on, man. Theology, debate, messaging, proclamation. He goes, in your thought life, you grab hold of everything that exalts itself against God. In your thought life. That's where God's concerned about, your thought life. He'll deal with all the stuff in the external He's really, really, really concerned with your thought life. My thought life governs the, my, my emotional and spiritual health. <sighs> Obedience, saying yes in the moment, is when you are thinking something that is not true or, th or entertaining something or fantasizing about something that exalts itself against God in whatever form or fashion, you know, if it's, if it's something that you wouldn't want to say out loud if Jesus was sitting across from you or you wouldn't want to say out loud to your friend, those kinds of thoughts, and this, it's, it's, it's not, it would be too simplistic to say, um, you know, if you're, like, explicitly worshiping another god, you know, and I know I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't want to belabor a point. I just, I, I think it's important to recognize that Paul's not saying, you know, if you start worshiping Buddha or Allah or just a fully different God, like shut that down. He's like, if you are speaking something over yourself that God would not speak over you, take that thought captive and bring it back to Jesus. You put a leash on that thing and you drag it to the throne, right? And you let him kill it. And he's actually going to train your hands for war and teach you how to kill it. Or if you are engaging in a fantasy that he condemns in the Sermon on the Mount, as a few examples, you put a leash on that thing and you drag it back to the throne. That's obedience in the moment, right? You don't, foster it and cultivate it. You take every thought captive into obedience to Jesus and you let him give you the lenses to, to look at the world. You know, we talk about people, oh, they see the world through rose colored glasses and it's a bad thing. But if we could borrow that kind of metaphor and say, God, give me your glasses so I can see as you see and, and help me interpret life and people the way that you see them. So I actually have a true narrative in my mind. I'm not going to sit here and stew and practice the argument that I can't wait to have with that person because I think they're an idiot. The Lord would go, I'm not really in that conversation. Put a leash on it and drag it to the throne and let him teach you how to dismantle these, these thought patterns that oppose his word and his truth and his proclamation and his testimony. And the really encouraging thing is, I mean, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. I got, I did my undergraduate in psychology. So if you're like, wow, she really geeks out over some of this research. I really do. But, uh, it's just, it's something that supports these things we see in scripture. It's not that scripture supports the research. The research actually just vindicates scripture but there is a, a phenomenon called neuroplasticity where you can a truly, um, I mean, this is a really simplistic way to put it, but you can reconfigure the roads in your brain, right? So if you have thought patterns or behaviors or habits and instincts, just stuff you've, I've been doing this since I was a kid, you need to break that habit, you need to break that disposition, you can do that. 
it is possible to do that. Nothing in your brain, nothing in your brain is, is completely dry cement that you have to go jackhammer up. Like even, even if, if a road is built, it's malleable. You can cut a new road and reroute the traffic of your thought life. That is possible because the Lord is kind and he doesn't command you to do something that you are physiologically unable to obey. Every word in scripture, every command in scripture, you actually can do it. You actually can obey it. So praise God. That's longer than I meant to spend on that point, but here we are. That's obedience, saying yes in the moment. Endurance is not saying no in the moment. Endurance is not quitting. So obedience, and this is, uh, these are just my definitions. Maybe somebody else would articulate this differently. And I bless you in the Lord. I would, I, this is the easiest way for me to understand it and for me to put it. So, uh, obedience is saying yes to Jesus in the moment, even when it's tempting, you know, we're being tempted by something else. Endurance is not saying no to Jesus. Endurance is not quitting. So obedience and endurance, I think, are fraternal twins, but not identical twins. Um, so there are a couple of verses that really encourage me related to this is in Matthew 11, Jesus is talking about um, John the Baptist. And he says, he talks John's in prison. He sends a couple of his disciples. They talk to Jesus. They're like, are you the guy or do we look for somebody else? And he goes, we'll go back and tell John that the blind see, the deaf hear, the prisoners getting liberated. All these cool things that have been prophesied are happening. I am in fact the guy. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And then he turns to everybody else and he goes, would you go out to the wilderness to see when you trekked all those miles under the hot Israeli sun to hear this guy wearing weird camel clothes and eating locusts and honey, this religious fanatic in the wilderness, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Did you think you were going to find some guy clothed in silk? Nope. You wanted to see a guy clothed in silk? You go to the palaces. Did you think you were going to see a reed shaken by the wind? Sorry, sweetheart, because John the Baptist had a backbone and you could not buy him. He was grounded in the word, right? And he says, we have played the flute for you and you did not dance. We have played the dirge for you and you did not mourn. We are proclaiming the message and you are not responding appropriately. But he says, wisdom will be justified by her children. So that's the context that that principle was first communicated in. But that principle on the whole is what I find particularly encouraging, that wisdom will be justified by her children. So when you say no to things that would actually give you a really cheap dopamine dopamine fix and make you feel really good in a moment. You go, no, I'm not going to do that because I am taking every thought captive or I'm bringing my body into submission under the Lordship of Jesus. So I'm going to say no to this cheap thing that would impede my my fellowship with the Lord in this moment. I'm going to say no, no to this and yes to Jesus because I'm going to obey the Lord and I'm going to do that as a lifestyle and not quit. So obedience and endurance. Sometimes it's not fun, right? Farmers, athletes, and soldiers are all giving themselves day by day in diligence to something that they're not really going to see the reward for until next year or years from now but they're diligent today. And unfortunately, wisdom will be justified by what she gives birth to over time. You might not see the vindication of the, the choice you're making in wisdom today. Obedience is always wisdom. Endurance is always wisdom, but you might not really see the fruition of it until later. And that's okay. Good things take time, right? So we're going to live in light of eternity. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's a, uh, you know, sometimes our English translations are a bit clunky and academic. That's saying, hey, you can run to Jesus when you need help and he will give you mercy and grace. You will find grace. Think of um, Genesis 6 when it's it, like you have 
like the Nephilim, everything's getting really wonky and kind of weird and super wicked. And the thoughts and intentions of everybody's heart is just sin all the time. But grace found Noah. You will find grace at the throne. So, you know, I've quoted Tim Keller before, and he says that we have, through adoption, because of Jesus' work on the cross, we have access to the King of glory, the Father of lights, the Father of glory at all times. And so sometimes we're, we're, we hinder ourselves and we go, well, you know, like he's God. He's not really, I'm going to come to him with like this like petty thing. But I love what Tim Keller says. He goes, we have a right and access to go wake up the King at 2.30 in the morning and demand a glass of water. And he would be disappointed I, I'm, I, I don't think Tim Keller's, I'm adding this now, but I think that if, you know, say if using this picture, if you're a little kid and your father woke up in the morning and found out that you had been parched and dehydrated all night, but you didn't ask for help to get water because you didn't want to bother him while he was sleeping, it would break his heart. He'd go, you're my kid. If you need water, come to me and I will help you. I will get you water. This is why James says in James 1, if you need wisdom, ask for wisdom and believe that he's actually going to give it to you. But if you ask him for wisdom and you don't think he's actually going to give you the wisdom that you're asking for, then you're just double-minded. You're being tossed at sea. You don't have an anchor. And, and not having confidence that God will help you when you need help is going to impede your endurance because you, you can't do this on your own. So, Ask him to help you endure and trust that he will help you endure. Um, I have a Henry School quote here. He wrote a, a book called, he wrote a letter to his friend that's now a book called The Life of God and the Soul of Man that you can get on Kindle for like a dollar um, that I really, 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 really recommend. Um so I'm going to read a little bit here because the, you know, the language, especially in the sessions up till now and be a good soldier and, you know, athletes have to compete according to the rules is really strong language and it's all in scripture, but I don't want to give an impression that like you have to harden up and do this for yourself and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't find a pull yourself up by your bootstraps theology in the Bible. You have a ask Jesus to help you put the boots on and lace them up. So we are, we are to put away childish things, but we are to always remain childlike because ultimately even you might, you might grow up and be as mature as you possibly can be, but you're never going to outgrow your father. So, um, the thing that helps me and I would encourage you to endure, you know, or I think of like the picture of, of hell week, Navy SEALs go through buds training and part of buds is hell week. And it is, I mean, like almost literally hell and they are, you know, cold and wet. They're on the beach, like the whole time. And, you know, the sand, if, if you know, if you've been, I grew up around the beach for a little bit and sand and water is really fun until you you really need to dry off. And if you don't dry off, then you just start chafing and you're uncomfortable and it's painful. So imagine that for a week and you're freezing cold and you haven't slept. And when you start to sleep, they wake you up and they make you run and carry heavy things. And like, it's just exhausting, but they have a bell. And if you ring the bell, you can go drink the hot coffee. You can change into dry clothes. You can go to sleep in a warm bed. All you have to do is ring the bell. And the only way that you can actually become a Navy SEAL and, and BUDS is only, it's like part of the training and the process to become a Navy SEAL. But the only way to actually do it and actually get the trident, you, you for sure cannot ring the bell in hell week. That's endurance. Don't quit. Don't ring the bell. And in the portrait of endurance, again, we are soldiers, but we're also sons and we're also, we're kids. And so, um, the Henry, this Henry Schugel book, I, I return to often because it, um, reminds it, it like helps bring me back and calibrate me back to like, Oh, I just, 
am a kid and I have a good dad. So I don't know if this, this passage is going to mean to you what it means to me, but I'm, I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, he says in, he's writing to a friend who's, um, and we would say today, we would say his friend is deconstructing. His, his friend is walking away from the faith. His friend is drowning in a, in a apostasy or, you know, or drinking the Kool-Aid of apostasy, which is like, we have to be pretty realistic about what the deconstruction trend was and is. But anyway, he's saying, to, he's writing this letter to his friend to encourage him. And it's a really beautiful brotherly letter that is now this book. And a part of it, he says, you know, in a word, what our blessed Savior said of himself is in some, me in some measure applicable to his followers, that it is their meat and drink to do their father's will. And as the natural appetite is carried out towards food, though we should not reflect on the necessity of it for the preservation of our lives, I should tell you this was written like the 18th century, if that's not already obvious. He says, so they are carried away with a natural and unforced propension toward that which is good and commendable. And it is true that external motives are many times of great use to excite and stir up this inward principle, especially in its infancy and weakness, when it is so often languid that the man himself can scarce discern it, hardly being able to move one step forward. But when he is pushed by his hopes or by his fears or by the pressure of an affliction or the sense of a mercy or the authority of the law or the persuasion of others to maturity, but he who is utterly destitute of this inward principle, that is the, it's, it is your food and drink to do your father's will, and you don't aspire to it and contempts, contents himself with performances or is motivated by fear of hell or carnal notions of heaven. You know, he, he can, it, <laughs> what he puts it is it can no more be accounted a religious person than a puppet than can be called a man. Like he says, this forced and artificial religion is commonly heavy and languid, like the motion of a weight forced upward. It's spiritless. He calls it an uneasy compliance of a wife towards her husband. There's no relationship there. There's no um, trust in the intimacies of your own, of your hearts. And so he's saying the, the, um, his friend wants to quit because he's exhausted by just the the mundane, what feels like mundane futility of obedience. And he's going, look, if all you're seeing is the task and you're not actually meeting your father in it, you are missing the life of God in your soul. This isn't about behavior modification. This is about meeting God in the depths of who you are and finding his depths because deep calls unto deep. And that is the strength of endurance and endurance and obedience. I think are mechanisms of anti-fragility that when you are pushed through fires and trials and adversities and persecutions that not that you sought them out, but that the Lord didn't save you from them, right? He didn't like Sometimes I think we're going to get on the other side of time and eternity and, and the Lord's going to turn the lights on and we're going to see and understand a lot of things that happened in our life. I think we're going to see a lot of darts that he just saved us from and completely blocked us from. And we never even knew that they were fired at us. What we, what we know of now are the darts that we didn't get saved from, that we actually got hit, you know, or like, the first one that I really remember in my life was my, my grandparent getting sick and dying despite all of my heroic prayers. Um, you know, and so for all of my offense and I was like, you didn't block that dart. You know, the Lord might be like, honey, there are like a thousand more that I did block. I allowed that one in here. And then, and then I, I think in the age to come, we'll have an understanding of, of the wisdom of God in allowing the darts that he, that he, didn't block, you know, that somehow hit us or hit people that we love. And maybe those darts actually cause our death in this age. And maybe they don't, maybe they just hurt for a while. And there are a season that we look back on and we go, I would never ask for that again. But I'm willing to bet that you can look back on some of the worst things you've ever gone through. I would never ask to go through that again. But I'll tell you what, there was gold in their hills. 
and the Lord dug that out with me and I discovered things about the Lord and I have, I fellowship with him now in a way that I, I didn't know before. It's like that passage in, in, uh, first Peter, second Peter, first Peter, he says that the genuineness of your faith, it, because it's more precious than gold that perishes, but in the way that we would test gold, it's tested by fire on the backside of that fire, you are found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. That's what that's what the trouble and trial and fire, all those darts and things that, that are allowed to penetrate your life in this age, it's for intimacy with the Lord. It's, it's He's trying to conform you into his image. You become what you behold. Right? So... Obedience, endurance, simple devotion to Jesus. 2 Corinthians eleven three. Do not be deceived or seduced away from simple devotion to Jesus. And I would say if you are like Henry Skogel and you have a friend who's being deceived or seduced away from simple devotion to Jesus, grab them by the legs and don't let them, you know, if they're if they insist on departing from the faith, let them drag you, you know hold them back as best you can. It's not just so that we don't ring the bell and quit. We also don't want the people around us to ring the bell and quit. So we're told in in Hebrews to encourage one another daily, lest a a seed of bitterness get in a root of bitterness, take hold. Bitterness is the thing that I think pushes you away from the faith. Um, You know, we talked in the last session about expectations and disillusionment and resentment or entitlement and disillusion and resentment that lead to bitterness and bitterness will kill your soul. You might, you might allow bitterness to take you out and then spend 50 or 60 more years, you know, let's say hypothetically you're like, like my story, I was like 17, 16, 17. If I had allowed that to be my narrative of Jesus, if I, if I let that dart hit me and infect me with bitterness and if bitterness is a, let's say in a spiritual sense, it's something like Lyme disease. Lyme disease just gets all up in your system and wreaks total havoc. But you can, and this isn't, you know, again, metaphors fall apart, but leveraging this metaphor, I'm going to squeeze everything that I can out of it. You get Lyme disease through a tick, right? And if the tick has, if it carries Lyme disease and it bites you and it bites you for long enough before you find it, get rid of it. If you are able to find it and identify it and get rid of it and clean the wound, even if it carries Lyme, you can prevent the infection, right? Or early treatment is best or something. So if I'm 16, 17 and I get hit with this dart and I'm offended at the Lord and I allow that offense to to foster and breed bitterness towards the Lord, I could have just stopped there and that would just be the story of my life. But what if I live until I'm 90 and I spend 70 plus years in bitterness? Fortunately, the Lord is very kind and he did not let that happen. I'm very grateful for that. Um, But you are not a puppet and you do have a an active role in your own formation and development with the Lord. So he's not, he didn't just pluck me out of offense. And then all of a sudden I was not offended. It was a dance, you know? And if ever I was like, you know what, I'm done. I don't want anything to do with this because you didn't save my family member. Then, then I'm allowing bitterness to write the story, you know, I'm going to move on. But I hope that that's encouraging or helpful. Somehow. So anyway, the fuel in the tank for endurance and obedience, and this is, you know, life over the long haul and and a life of anti-fragility to actually be qualitatively improved by the hardship that you endure as you obey is rest and recovery. Um, You cannot take on new strain without adequate recovery. So this is why I really love the the pictures that Paul gives us in 2 Timothy 2 of farmers, athletes, and soldiers, because you can get a lot out of these metaphors. And for example, athletes cannot 
train and 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 never sleep. They have to recover. So you train, you eat, sleep, recover, train, eat, sleep. Maybe you eat, you train, you sleep, whatever. But you have to do those three things. You could just eat and sleep and eat and sleep and eat and sleep, but then you're not putting your body under any strain, so you're not going to get stronger or more fit, right? You're just going to coast in comfort. And we've said before that consistent comfort creates crises. If you don't put your heart under strain, your heart is actually more likely to get sick. But if you put your heart under regular strain, your heart is more likely to be healthier and live longer and serve your body better. So you you want to be able to put yourself under new strain. Life comes at you fast. You want to be able to endure the strain of life, but you have to rest and you have to recover. And I, maybe this is too figurative to be helpful, but I would say in my working definition of rest and recovery is is um, the place where you feel your father smile. So I, th- I think it was in the last session we talked about Eric Liddell, who was the Olympic runner. And he said, I feel his, I feel God's pleasure over me when I run. And whatever that is for you, whatever that running thing is for you, build, literally build a rhythm of it into your life. Hey guys, I trust that you're enjoying the teaching. Wanted to interrupt very briefly just to extend the following invitation. If you've benefited from, if you've been edified by the teaching that we share with you all, we're asking you to prayerfully consider becoming a regular $5 a month supporter. The foundation for everything that we do here at Frontier Alliance International is to lay foundations where there are none. If you resonate, if you connect with this goal of seeing the workers who are on the ground cared for, funded, provided for, in order that they can continue to share the good news, to make disciples, to spread this Maranatha message to the ends of the earth, then again, we're asking you to prayerfully consider becoming a regular supporter. If you're already a supporter, thank you so much. Again, if you're not, we just ask you to pray about it. Uh, The links to give are either going to be at the bottom of the video or in the app. We'll make sure that they're available. Uh, FAImission.org. Again, thank you so much. Back to the teaching. Um, you know, some of the best advice I've ever gotten was from our our moms and dads who have shepherded us as pioneering and and leadership roles, particularly in the 1040 window. The 1040 window is the longitudinal and latitudinal region. That's kind of the the final frontier of gospel proclamation. Um, mostly, mostly the Muslim world. Um, it's a, you know, it's a hard place to live. You have a lot of abnormal stressors on top of just normal life stress. But, um, we met with, we had some meet like five years ago. I think it was like five, six years ago. And we had this kind of family meeting and said, you know, Hey, what kind of you guys have been around the, the block a lot. You've coached a lot of people doing this work. Like you, you know, things that we don't know and we don't know what we don't know. What advice do you have for us? And they're like, man, we love your zeal. Cause I, I think we were all, you know, at best in our early thirties, but, um, still quite young, little bright eyed, bushy tailed whippersnappers with all the best intentions. And you know what they say about good intentions, you know? So, um, they said, we love your zeal and we don't want to tell you to quit or slow down or tell you that you need to do less, but we will tell you that if you do not Shabbat, if you do not Sabbath, you will run yourselves into the ground and you'll become a liability to your own health and that of those around you, both, you know, on your team and in your community and the people that you're trying to serve. So we were like, okay, well, what does that even mean? And this was, this is advice I'd, I'm ripping straight from Martin Mallory, who I mentioned in the, the last session, he said, you know, you should Sabbath or, or Shabbat, I've Shabbat built into my vernacular because, but they're synonymous. Um, not only weekly and that weekly ordinance of the Sabbath was actually established and ordained in Genesis one. 
uh, tail end of Genesis 1 into Genesis 2, God saw that everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The Sabbath was sanctified in Genesis 1. So this is before Abraham, before Isaac, and before Jacob. So what I'm saying is this, if you are not Jewish, you are still the way that you, you're still a human. And the rhythm that God built into creation is that you would rest from your work, from ordinary work. So, you know, I figured out with the Lord what that looks like for you. I, I don't put a lot of stipulations around it. Like I'm actually really rejuvenated by going outside or taking my dog on a long trail or going to the beach or going for a swim or hanging out with friends. And I, I'm, I'll go to bed Saturday night tired, but I'm not exhausted from work. I'm actually like, say you have, um, using the, the, the uh, let's say Saturday is the day off, Saturday is Shabbat. Sunday through Friday, you're working and maybe it's, it's pulling life from you. It's good work, but it's, it's tire. It's taking something from you. Shabbat or Sabbath is, is meeting God in the word. You know, I'm not just like a, I find God in the trees, but God made the trees, you know, in the word and in creation somehow that I encounter my father and I feel him smiling over me and over the people in my family. Um, and so Martin's advice to us was do like not weekly, but not just weekly. He said, do it every day. And, you know, or Jeff would say tithe a portion of your day. So if you're awake for, I don't know, the math that he, that he had that worked out was like 90 minutes. You, if you tithe your day, you give the Lord 90 minutes of your day or figure it out. However, this works for you daily, weekly, even monthly, quarterly, annually, build in rhythms of rest into your life where you come back and you are calibrated back to that voice of intimacy who says, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Don't wait until you're burnt out and fried and you like need it and it's an emergency. Do it regularly so that you actually stay healthy for the long haul. And that'll actually in, in equip you and enable you to serve the people around you and bear enduring fruit with enduring joy. You bear fruit in your own internal life with the Lord and you bear fruit externally. You know, you have the vertical relationship with the Lord, the horizontal relationship with the people around you. Um, and you will see a pattern that Jesus did this. He would withdraw, pray. And then in fact, the pattern in his life is that he would withdraw to be with the Lord. He'd pray, you know, he prayed to withdraw to be with his father it's a little difficult to use language, you know, and it's like God praying with God, but you know, um, Jesus would withdraw, pray, and then he would be intruded upon by a crowd or people who wanted something from him. And he didn't go, God, leave me alone. He would serve them. So he had this pattern of pouring out and coming back and receiving from the father and pouring out and receiving from the father in a way that he didn't get resentful or, or, tied up or bound up with the spirit of entitlement, right? He was able to serve because he had a healthy pattern of rest and recovery so that he could come under new pressure and strain, right? So Luke 5, Mark 3, Matthew 12, Luke 6, Matthew 14, I'll have um, examples and patterns of this. Um, but I am coming in for a landing here. And I, I, I'll just exhort you in this way, in a very practical level, you are responsible for yourself. You are an adult. You are responsible for yourself. You are responsible for getting in the word. And some of the best advice I've ever received is that the, you know, if the word, it, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. And so let's say the word of God is like the bread of life, which is uh, all of this is language from Jesus. There, are, my friend was like, there are like a hundred different ways to eat bread, right? You might have toast. Some of you crazy people might put like Marmite or Vegemite on your toast. 
or butter or avocado if you're a millennial, whatever, or a croissant or I like whatever, you know, stretch the metaphor wherever you need to go. Just eat the bread, not counterfeit bread, but eat the bread. So sometimes and I'm like, man, if I open the Bible and look at it, I'm just staring at the page and I'm not reading anything. You know what I do? I crack open my little audiobook thing and Johnny Cash recorded the entire New Testament and I just hit play and I let the man in black read the words of life to me. I can do that when I'm driving. I can do that when I'm walking the dog. The important thing is you just get in the word, but you are responsible for you. Your baseline, baseline health practice has to be eating the word, right? You have to eat the bread of life. So if you're malnourished, it's not the, anybody else's fault. It's your fault. Get in the word, stay in the word, stay in it, whether you think you need to be in it or not, or maybe you're bored, whatever, find a different way to eat the bread. But do not make a practice of not being in the word. So, you know, people that I have watched who are so fiery and so zealous and they're going after the Lord and 10 years later, they're burnt out or they're disillusioned or they're bitter or whatever, then they quit. You know why they quit? They'll tell you it's because of, you know, I got hit by a dart and now I'm mad at the thing and a good and loving God would never let that happen or whatever. Ultimately, 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 they, they stopped praying. They're not in the word and they stopped praying. I have never met anybody, anybody who said, I searched and searched and searched and searched and I met him and he's a liar and he's not who he says that he is and he's, he wasn't worth it. I've, n I've never met anybody who could fairly say that because Jesus is who he says that he is. I do know people who went through hardship and, a, and a, just drank the Kool-Aid of accusation against the Lord. And that became the narrative. And that became the glasses that they wore. And now they see everything through the lens of accusation. Jeff tells me often, he says, Stephanie, you can be a really good recorder and a really bad interpreter. <laughs> like Maybe your interpretation of that very accurate record of events is not completely fair or accurate. Maybe you need to take that to the Lord and let him tell you what you're missing in that narrative. You have to do that. So anyways, you are responsible for you. So by all means, if you need help, seek out help. Seek out pastoral help. If you need professional help, don't be ashamed to do that. Seek out professional help. Forge friendships with friends that you can confess your sins to and be the kind of friend that people can confess their sins to. And on a just a baseline level, like take care of yourself. Basic self-care is physiological. So basic, let's say spiritual and emotional care is being in the word and being in healthy friendships and relationships and community. Just literally being healthy requires meeting super basic needs that I think are, you know, if, we, if you live in, in a very convenient culture or society, it's we just miss basic, basic things like sunshine, movement, hydration, nutrition. There is a crisis of comfort and we are killing ourselves for lack of strain and stress. So get outside, get in the sun, move, drink water, eat actual food with actual nutrients. Take care of yourself because if you think, gosh, I just feel so depressed and anxious and stressed out. I, my first question would be, when was the last time you saw the sun? Or are you sleeping at night? Or are you not sleeping at night because your whole system's out of whack because you're binging sugar all day or processed foods all day? So depression, anxiety, stress, all those things are real, but eliminate counterfeit variations of them so that if you actually, you know, if you're like, I'm doing everything I can, or, you know, clinical depression, you'd be like, I actually can't do everything I can. I really do need help. But you know, again, this is a YouTube video, guys, <laughs> like this is not a professional thing. And I, I stopped at my bachelor's. I didn't go in and do graduate work. So I'm not giving you professional advice. By all means, seek out professional help. All I'm saying is get outside, move your body, drink water, eat real food, sleep at night and, and connect with people in real life, face to face, not just on your phone. Anyway, um, Get in the word, rest, meet your father, feel his smile, and indeed, Shabbat Shalom, Maranatha.